I think most everybody is back and we're ready to go here. It's a real pleasure to introduce Bishop Don Hine, Bishop of uh, Madison. Uh, Bishop was ordained a priest for the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, and a little write up on him. You can read that yourselves and all the things that he's done and stuff. But uh, yeah, he was uh, uh, was uh, the head of or the dean of the formation at uh, St. Francis Seminary for a few years. Was named rector of St. Francis and uh, ordained an auxiliary bishop for Milwaukee. And three years, four years later, named. Bishop of Gary, Indiana, and when uh, Bishop Morlino passed away from Madison, uh, Bishop Hyen was named Bishop of Madison, and so back into the province, and what a wonderful gift it is to the province. So uh, let's welcome Bishop now. Thank you so much, Bishop Powers. I have great esteem for your bishop, and being up here just makes me realize in a more profound way the, the enormity of your diocese. So I had um, confirmations in Portage last night and then drove up from there. So even from Portage, it was still a four and a half hour drive and didn't see one deer, thank goodness. But um, yeah, our Madison Diocese, I think, is um, 8,000 square miles. Superior is over 15. So it's almost double in terms of geographic space. I love snowmobiling and cross-country skiing, so I have friends that have a place near uh, Three Lakes. So I always pray for uh, the bishop when I'm up there snowmobiling and um, enjoying God's beautiful creation. So we'll just begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Heavenly Father, as we gather, we ask that you send forth an abundance of your Holy Spirit upon us. We ask that you continue to anoint us in this great task of proclaiming the gospel, of evangelization, of preaching your word. Help us to be so imbued in your word that, that our lives may be a reflection of the power poured forth for us through your cross and resurrection. Fill us with your grace and mercy, and may this day be one of, of rest, of joy, of renewal, and of fraternity for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today's the optional memorial of St. Margaret Mary, which turns our thoughts to uh, the Sacred Heart. And we know that it was on the Feast of St. John, December 28th, right before the Great Silence. Uh, St. Margaret Mary was praying in the chapel of her convent when she had her first extraordinary vision of Jesus. And he came to her just absolutely translucent with light. And his heart was a transparent within his body. And it was, it was bleeding, it was on fire, crowned with thorns. And it was at that moment that the Lord said, Behold this heart that has loved men so much. So I can't help but ponder how much uh, that sacred heart loves every single one of you. Because the Lord has personally, profoundly, intimately called you uh, to the service of the church. So I was praying about coming here, praying for all of you. And uh, kept asking the Lord, what, what is it that you want me to say to them? And um, many thoughts came into my head. But the central one was just tell them how much I love them. Tell them how profoundly they are wrapped in my heart. And that in, in moments of challenge and, and tribulation and exhaustion and anxiety, we, we need to take refuge in that heart of Christ. Because it's there that we find peace. It's there that um, our vigor and enthusiasm are renewed. Today's also the 45th anniversary of the election of uh, St. John Paul II, which it was on a Monday that year, as it is a Monday this year. And his uh, memorial is on October 22nd, because it was the following Sunday that he celebrated his inaugural mass in St. Peter's Square. And it was in that homily that he said, be not afraid. Open wide the doors to Christ. 
which became the whole theme of the Jubilee year of 2000. But at that time, the world was still um, divided between uh, communism and the free world. And so having come from behind the Iron Curtain, when he said, open the vast fields of political systems and economies, open the vast world of science and culture to Christ, do not be afraid of that. Those are radical words. And the very next year, uh, he went to Poland for the first time. And uh, the Polish president received a call from President Brezhnev of the Soviet Union before that trip and said, don't let him in. You can't let him in. Because if you let him in, he's going to be the undoing of our entire system. And the Polish president said to President Brezhnev, how do you tell the first Polish pope in history that he can't come back to Poland? Like, we have to let him in. So Brezhnev said, well, do what you want, but you're going to live to regret it if you say yes. And those words were prophetic. Because during that trip, John Paul never said communism is evil. He never said overthrow the government. You know, he never said you know, stand up and revolt. He simply proclaimed the power of the gospel. And there was this unforgettable moment. He was saying mass in Victory Square in Warsaw. It was on Pentecost Sunday. And there were two million people there. And in the middle of his homily, he simply said, Jesus Christ cannot be written out of human history. Today, you'd probably say, Jesus Christ can't be canceled, right? <laughs> but everybody that heard those words knew what he was saying. Because that's precisely what the communists were trying to do, was write Jesus Christ out of history. He couldn't go on with his homily for another 10 minutes because the people started singing, started crying, started rejoicing because they understood in that moment that communism was finished because John Paul had simply proclaimed the power of the word. And so he was the great evangelizer of his age. And I purposely tell that story because it just shows the power that the Holy Spirit anoints our proclamation of the word with. So no matter how unworthy we feel, no matter how ill-prepared we may feel in the front of a particular homily, um, no matter how inadequate we may feel as the messenger, if we truly ask the Holy Spirit to anoint uh, the power of our proclamation of the word, we need to profoundly trust uh, that God will anoint that word. And, and that it will be cast into our people's hearts. So today, um, I think there's four one-and-a-half-hour talks. I'm not sure if I can talk for six hours to save my life. And um, I'm not sure if you want to hear me for six hours. So we'll just see how the day goes. But kind of my, my four principal themes. Um, first talk, just talking essentially my, my articulation of the charisma. I know you heard Father John Ricardo, so I would never dare to be on that level of eloquence and passion. But I think every single one of us needs to kind of digest the kerygma and have our own articulation of it. So I just want to share mine, kind of just as a, a proclamation of, of the good news. I, I just find that every time I speak of the kerygma or do a mission on it, um, I don't necessarily know what God's doing in the hearts of my listeners. I know what he's doing in my heart. So just to proclaim the kerygma, like, renews it inside of me. So how important it is that we ponder that over and over. A second talk is just going to be on some of the fundamental principles of charismatic preaching. Um, kind of what that looks like. What, what are some of the presuppositions to make our preaching uh, truly charismatic? The third, and this is the sketchiest one, uh, would be like, how do we incorporate the kerygma into the different parts of our, our ministry and in our catechesis and in our, our pastoral service with our people? I think that's, of the four, that's the least one I have thought out. So that might be where I ask you to go take a walk for 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the last one is simply to talk about what we're doing in Madison with our evangelizing initiative, Go Make Disciples, and now our strategic plan into the deep. So that's kind of... Those are the, are the four topics of the day. I certainly don't uh, claim any particular um, expertise. 
or brilliance on any of those topics. I'm simply a sinner who's been a priest for uh, going on 35 years and a bishop for 12. Um, I never studied in Rome. I was never a Monsignor. I never worked in the Chancery. I don't know how I became a bishop. I was just a, a parish priest that uh, became rector of the seminary. But um, by God's grace, God puts us everywhere that he wants us to be. One of the most transformative experiences of my life was I was blessed to do four years of mission work in the Dominican Republic as my second assignment, which is almost 30 years. And we had 27 villages spread out over 50 square miles, and there were two priests. And I think God was preparing me to be a bishop because our parish was more like a diocese than it was uh, a parish. I knew two words in Spanish when I went there, cerveza and baño. <laughs> and, um, so I could only go up from there. But I think uh, the greatest experience of poverty is probably living in a culture where you can't speak the language. It's probably the greatest experience of poverty because you're totally dependent. And no matter what your accomplishments or how smart you think you are, like none of that matters because it boils down to can you communicate? And I just found that as I was struggling to learn Spanish, like people would talk louder at me, like somehow that was gonna help me understand. Um, talk down to me. And you just realize the, the challenge of living in another culture and looking at all of our international priests. And I can't imagine the culture shock of having grown up in a place like India and then finding yourself in a little town in northern Wisconsin. I mean, just talk about the, the radical change of that. But, but that's where we learn our, our dependence on the Lord, um, for certain. So about two months ago, I was on um, an airplane, and a woman came on board, and she saw my collar, and she said, oh, I feel so much better knowing you're on board. We probably <laughs> have a experience. And I said, that doesn't help me. Who's going to hear my confession when this thing goes down? Right? But she ended up sitting next to me. And very early in the flight, she said, I was raised without any religion. I was never baptized. My parents never took me to church. My parents never even talked to me about God. And she simply said, tell me what you believe. Isn't that a, a profound opportunity? Just tell me what you believe. So I gave her, I thought, this is great. I got a captive audience for two hours. I mean, we'll be on Thomas Aquinas by the time we land. But um, I just gave her like maybe a 15 minute articulation of the kerygma. And at the end, she took it all in, and what she said was very surprising to me. She was quiet for a moment, and then she said, everything that you've said is so beautiful. But it's so beautiful that it seems too good to be true. It seems too good to be true. And I said, can you dare to believe that it is true? Because if you just take that little leap of faith and let's just suppose for a moment that this is the explanation of the universe, that the whole scriptural narrative is the articulation of the meaning of your own life. Like let's just suppose for a moment that that's true. How would that change your life? I pray for her. I don't know what she did with all that when we left, but um, we're surrounded by people who essentially do not know the Lord. And it's really, the Lord has strategically placed us in a position to do something about that and, and to share, share our faith and to share the gospel. So when you become a new bishop, all sorts of wild things happen to you. Um, every clergy apparel house in the country calls you because <laughs> they want your business. There's people that create um, Episcopal um, regalia and models call you because they want your business. But you have to go on this nine-day um, bishop boot camp in Rome. Bishop Powers, you were part of that, weren't you? And uh, so there about 120 bishops. We were gathered at the Regina Postalorum, the, the legionnaire seminary outside of Rome for nine days. And nothing about it was practical. Like, I just wanted to learn, like, when do I put on the miter? When do I hold the crozier? We never got to that. It was um, people coming over from the Vatican, reading at us in Italian for an hour and a half without once looking up. I didn't know Italian, so there's this seminarian translating it in my ear. 
and there was no Q and A. It was just classic European way of educating, right? You just read your piece and you leave. So after about three days, I was having out of body experiences. It was like, <laughs> like this is, I, th I guess if, if I can do this, I can do anything, and maybe maybe that's the point. But I think you would agree with me that when we go to um, conferences or professional days of renewal or whatever, oftentimes the most impactful part is not necessarily the formal part of the agenda. Oftentimes it's meeting somebody in the hallway, having a conversation over lunch, meeting somebody that does what you do somewhere else. And that happened to me. So one day I was having lunch across the table from a newly consecrated bishop from the southern Netherlands, uh, a diocese in southern Holland. And I asked him to tell me about his diocese. And he said, our mass attendance of baptized Catholics in our diocese hovers at about 2%. And most of those people are in their 70s and 80s. So we have these vast churches that are essentially empty. He had zero seminarians. So there was no future of the priesthood. And it wasn't so much that the church had collapsed as it had like just evaporated. So I asked him, so in that challenging situation, what are you going to do first? Like, how do you even begin? I mean, I would be overwhelmed. What he said didn't surprise me, but it's remained with me these last 12 years. He said, we have to go back to Pentecost. We have to go back to the upper room. We need to drink deeply of the Holy Spirit. And then we need to go into the world and proclaim Christ as if people have never heard of him, because in fact, they really haven't. And I thought that's exactly right. I just want to reflect a little bit on the Pentecost event uh, to set the context for the charisma. How I would love to have been a fly on the wall in the upper room that morning. I mean, what, what happened up there? I mean, did their hair catch on fire? Did they get thrown against the wall? We don't know. What we do know is the difference that the advent of the Holy Spirit made. Because when they went into that room, those first followers of Christ were silent about their experience of the resurrection. They were tentative. They were uncertain of what to do next. Simon Peter wants to go back to fishing, as we know uh, from John's Gospel at one point. Uh, they're afraid. When they come out of that room, they are completely transformed. They are on fire. They are courageous. They are articulate. They are united, and they know exactly what to do. They're going to spend the rest of their lives proclaiming the resurrection of Christ. They're going to spend the rest of their lives articulating the charisma and inviting people to join them in this new communion of the church and to find salvation, forgiveness, and mercy in the Lord. And it's Simon Peter, of all people, Simon who denied even knowing the Lord 50 days before this. Now he's standing up. He's standing up full of fire and power. The people that knew him before must have thought, what happened to you? Who is this? But it's Simon Peter who proclaims the charisma for the very first time, and it comes to us in Acts chapter 2. He says, let the whole house of Israel know for certain that this man, Jesus, whom you crucified, the Lord has raised him up and made him both Lord and Messiah. Let the whole house of Israel know for certain that this man, Jesus, whom you crucified, God has raised him up and made him both Lord and Messiah. So some of the people in that crowd were at least complicit in the death of Christ. So Peter is convicting them of that, but then saying, look at what God has done with your act of violence. So he has raised this Jesus from the dead, and all of reality has been transformed forever. I love what comes next. It says the crowd was cut to the heart. I love that phrase. It's the same phrase that the synoptics use in response to John the Baptist preaching. It says the crowd was cut to the heart. So I ask you, when have you been cut to the heart? When have I been cut to the heart? I was cut to the heart the morning I was ordained a priest. 
Because God was so real and powerful that morning that any time I'm afraid, anxious, tired, sad, I just go back to that moment and it's like sticking my finger into an electrical socket. It's like, like all, all the power and fire come back. I was cut to the heart the Wednesday before Thanksgiving when I was in first grade. I came running home from a friend's house for dinner found out my brother Patrick, who had been ill in the hospital with cancer, had died that afternoon. And he was very sick, but I was only six, and I thought, well, of course he's going to get better. He's going to come home. But I'll never forget, we prayed the rosary every night after supper, 365 days a year in my family, whether we wanted to or not, and I didn't always (laughs) want to. But I'll never forget the rosary that night. Like the combination of grief and faith. I was cut to the heart. It was about, about 10 years ago, I was at a wedding in Milwaukee, and a man I had never met came up to me at the reception and said, did you grow up on 92nd Street in West Dallas? I said, yes. Did you have a brother, Patrick, who died of cancer at the beginning of fifth grade? Yes. He said, he and I were really good friends, and I have to tell you, I have prayed to him my entire life, and I can't tell you how many times he's helped me. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking, he's talking to my, about my dead brother who's been gone 50 plus years, and the impact that he's had on his life. Mm-hmm. So the, the power of those moments when we're cut to the heart. Maybe you were cut to the heart, those of you that are married, the day you proposed marriage to your spouse, and she said yes or the birth of your child, or for us as priests, perhaps it was some seemingly ordinary Sunday morning and the reality of what we were doing at Mass overwhelmed us. Or maybe it was a a really powerful confession where we were weighed down with a particular sin and we confessed that and we felt the mercy of God in a way that we had never felt before. Are we not kept to the heart when we experience Uh, the beauty and power and transcendence of nature. But ultimately, we're cut to the heart whenever we hear the gospel and that it, it impacts us. And like the three kings, we can't go back home the same way we came because we've been so profoundly changed. What strikes me as well about Pentecost and the early church is that they immediately go out they go out in every direction of the four winds with absolute confidence that even if they are physically alone, they are now bound in this communion of discipleship in the mystery of the church. So tradition tells us that St. James goes to Spain. Peter, of course, ends up in Rome. Thomas to India. Philip to Ethiopia. Mary Magdalene to France. I'm afraid if... um, Pentecost happened today, instead of that happening, they would have sat down and formed a long-range study committee on evangelization, right? <laughs> Let's talk for 10 years about this. Let's come up with a plan. We'll drink pots of coffee, and we'll have charts and graphs, and if things really get out of control, we'll evangelize Jerusalem in 10 years. Thank goodness they didn't do that. Right? They were so filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit that gave them absolute confidence They could go to a a foreign place they had never been with the absolute conviction that God was with them and that if they were faithful to proclaiming the word, that the God would bless and anoint that. Historians would tell us that by the fourth century, half, at least half of the Greco-Roman population had converted to the faith and were members of the church. That's extraordinary success. That in less than 400 years, half of the population, at least, had become members of this, of this new movement. How can we explain that? I think through the Holy Spirit, there's at least three reasons. One, those first followers of Christ proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus with absolute confidence to every person they met. They just picture them grabbing every person by the toga and saying, let me tell you about this man, Jesus, that I met. That I first came to know as a miracle worker, 
and a rabbi, but ultimately is the Son of God, whose death on the cross and his resurrection is, is the meaning of the scriptures and the, the meaning of life for us. Secondly, we think of the, the radical charity of the early church. It says the, the followers of the Lord held all things in common and that they would sell their property and lay the money at the apostles' feet. So in a culture that practiced polygamy, Christians upheld monogamy and the sanctity of marriage. In a culture that practiced infanticide, the church from the beginning was profoundly pro-life. In a world that people ran away from disease and death, Christians rushed in to take care of the poor and the sick and the suffering. And it was out of the Christian context that the whole idea of a hospital was born. So people must have looked at those first Christians and thought, I don't know much about this Jesus. I don't understand their gospel. But look at how they love one another. So the profound, radical, fiery charity of the early church was in and of itself evangelizing. And the third, they're willing to be martyrs. They're willing to give up their lives rather than their faith. <coughs> so the church has written down every name of every man, woman, or child that gave their life for the Lord. We remember them in the liturgy. We, we save their blood. We collect their relics. We celebrate mass on their tombs. Because every martyr is both an extension and a replication of the ultimate martyr, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us. So we honor the martyrs because we see in them the, the absolute demand that the gospel puts on us. That there, if Jesus is Lord, then no one else is Lord. If Jesus is Messiah, then, then I, I must submit myself completely to his authority and to his power. And in that submission, I find freedom. It's no accident that every dictator, every totalitarian system, every oppressor in the last 2,000 years, their first thing that they want to do is to destroy the church. Because every dictator and totalitarian <coughs> system arrogantly wants to say, I am Lord. I am master. I am Messiah. And we as Christians cannot submit to any other than, than Jesus. And so when, when those forces of the world come rushing at the church, raging at the church, they may martyr the church. They may destroy our buildings. They may even kill our people. But they can never destroy the church. The church is founded on, on the Lord Jesus and imbued by the Holy Spirit. We live, of course, in a troubling age in so many ways today. We look at the terrible war in the Holy Land, the war in Ukraine, uh, the overwhelming violence and poverty in places like Haiti, um, civil wars in Africa. I'm on the uh, executive board for Catholic Relief Services, and something like 20% of the world's population is in danger of starvation right now. Never makes the evening news. And then we look at our own country, the paralysis of our government, um, the woke culture, all the forces that are against uh, the integrity of the faith and the gospel. We, we see our people confused, afraid, many of them slipping away. It's into that world, this world, that we have been sent to proclaim the transforming power of the gospel. In many ways, it's not that different from the world that those first apostles found themselves in. There's a murderous, violent, unjust world that was pagan and confused. So I'm convinced if we could pick up a description of the Greco-Roman world but didn't know where it came from, we'd think it would be describing our age in many ways. So in one sense, the fallen world has never changed but neither has the power of, of the proclamation of the gospel for us. So the kerygma comes from the Greek word meaning essential message. And I always say to people, it's kind of like our elevator speech. It's like if somebody asked you, what does it mean to be Catholic? Um, what would you say if you had about 15, 20 minutes to do it? Kind of like uh, uh, the, the woman that I talked to on the plane. 
So as you know, um, Father Ricardo and others kind of divided into four parts. And I just wanted to reflect on, on each one of those for a little bit. So first is creation. The God created the world out of nothing, ex nihilo. And that he made us as the crown of his creation. We know that from Genesis. That we were made in the image and likeness of God. What a remarkable thought. I remember asking my mother when I was about five years old, who made God? So I was learning that God had made everything that was. So I thought, well, who made him? So she said, you'll never figure it out. God always was and always will be. You'll never <clears throat> understand it. So I immediately tried to figure it out. So I was thinking like, <laughs> like a thousand billion years ago, I was trying to imagine like going back a thousand billion years and God was there. Going forward a thousand billion years from now, this planet is gone, the sun is burnt out, we have been dust for millennia, and God will still be. The eternity of God. The wonder of that. The shortness and brevity of this life in, in light of that. And yet in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul reminds us that God has loved us from all eternity. That before he even laid the foundations of the world, he already knew us and loved us, and in his great providential wisdom has willed us into being in the exact way, the exact place, and the exact time that he wants us to be. So that our life is not an accident. We're not simply a highly evolved animal. We're not simply the fruit of random circumstances colliding together. That, that God loved us and willed us to be from all eternity, the wonder of our being. G.K. Chesterton calls all of us great might not have beens. What does that mean? His point is to ponder, ponder the enormity of circumstances that had to align absolutely perfectly for us to be. Like our, our parents had to meet. They had to choose to marry each other. They had to be open to children. We were conceived. We were born. Think of all the illnesses, accidents, unforeseen circumstances that could have snuffed us out at any point and yet didn't. So all these forces had to come together in an absolutely perfect way for every single one of us to be. Pull one little thread, change one little fact, and poof, we go out of existence. I'm living proof of that because my father grew up on farms west of Madison so I've got about 250 cousins in the diocese where I am, so I feel very much at home. At least they claim to be my cousins, I don't know. I got a lot more cousins since I became Bishop of Madison. But um, my dad grew up on a farm, never went to high school because they needed him on the farm, was drafted into World War II, um, guarded Japanese POWs on Guam. So he's never been more than 20 miles away from home, also he's on the other side of the world guarding Japanese prisoners. Comes home, uh, moves to Milwaukee, takes a factory job, and in August of 1951, dropped something heavy on his foot and had to go see the company nurse. That was my mother. That's all they met. So even when his foot got better, he kept pretending that it hurt so he could go see her. <laughs> my dad was a very thoughtful man. So like he would think for 10 years before buying a new lawnmower. It's like, we don't need it. He grew up in the Depression. But he said as soon as he met my mother, he immediately knew that he was going to marry her, that that was God's will. So he hurts his foot in August of 51. They're married by June of 52. So I always say, if my father had not hurt his big toe in 1951, I would not exist. <laughs> and my five brothers would not have existed. Just to prove the point. Something that seems so random, so accidental, if that hadn't happened, chances are my parents would never have met. And I wouldn't be. So every single one of us can tell our own version of that. Which just goes to show that nothing really in our life is accidental. And that it's somehow all willed, or at least allowed by the Lord, that, that it must be. So we are made in the image and likeness of God. What does that mean? I think at least four things. Number one, it means that we have a soul. 
we have a soul and that we are destined to live forever with the Lord. That we will live forever with God or without God, depending on how we, we live this life for him or, or not. But that we are imperishable. We are going to live forever. Think about that for a moment. But even if we live to be 100 years old, that's just a wisp of smoke, just a snap of the fingers in light of eternity. St. Teresa of Avila said that this life is like one night in a bad inn, and then it's over forever. The, the wonder of eternity, the wonder of our soul, that we are spiritual and corporal beings, that in essence our, our very being is a union of the spiritual and the physical world, because there's both a physicality but also a profound supernatural aspect of our being, the wonder of a human person. Secondly, it means that we have an intellect. And I was looking for my phone. It's here somewhere. When I hold my smartphone, I'm probably holding more technology than Houston had when we put man on the moon. Right? So think of the, the, the wonder of the human intellect, all that the human mind has created, devised, imagined. And yet ultimately, we have an intellect for one purpose, to know God. And that we can know God. That God is not unknowable, even though he is transcendent and mysterious. That he reveals himself enough for us to know him and to find salvation in him. But the gift of our intellect, and to use it for, for true knowledge leading to wisdom. Thirdly, we have a heart that we can love as God loves. And even though my heart is puny in comparison to the infinite heart of God, when I love unconditionally, generously, sacrificially, I am most like God. And as St. Bernard reminds us, nothing is lacking where everything is given. So even if I have little to give, or if I give it all, God is made manifest in that. And fourthly, we have a will. And that's where things get messed up, right? Because... God gives us freedom. We're not puppets. He doesn't simply control us. He has given us freedom to choose, to embrace him or to reject him. And it's in that freedom that we find both our human dignity, but also the, the dangerous shoals of sin and death. But, but God gives us a will. That's such a mystery, isn't it? Because God gives us a will even though he knows we're going to mess it all up. But he does it anyway because he loves us so. So ultimately, that, that act of creation and ourselves as um, images of God in human form reminds us that our deepest identity is that we are beloved children of God. And I think that's so essential for us to constantly remind our people the divine filiation, that we are children of God, and that, that is our deepest identity. Imagine if every person woke up every morning thinking that thought. I'm a beloved son of the Father. I'm a beloved daughter of God. So next time you're at a party and somebody asks, who are you? Just say, I'm a son of the Father. I've been purchased with the precious blood of Christ. I've been anointed in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's who I am. I watch them run for cover. They, <laughs> they won't know what to do with that. But that's, that's who we are. That's exactly who we are. So that the, the wonder of creation and that wonder of our creation is really the first movement in the charisma. The second, of course, is the original sin, the, the fall, the cosmic shipwreck at the beginning of the world, and we still feel the implications of that. So it's important for us to understand Genesis chapter 3 if we seek to be charismatic because we need to be able to understand sin and death and to articulate to people its, its power over us and the fact that we are sinners. And I think that, that's a missing piece today because if we don't get in touch with our sinfulness, then we'll never realize that we need a savior. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, a tendency in our modern culture today to kind of 
deny sin, deny our fallen nature, and that becomes very dangerous because then people seek to create utopias. Right? Like that somehow we're perfectible on our own. I think I'm too young to remember this, but I know like before Vatican II, there were these old-fashioned parish missions. You know, um, religious sort of priests would go around and preach these fire and brimstone missions for a week in a parish, scare everybody half to death. But what was the point of that? It was to convict people of their sin. It was to convict people of their radical real need for Christ and to help them to realize that. And that's a good thing. So when God puts Adam and Eve in the garden, they're essentially free to do whatever they want, except eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What does that represent? What does that mean? It symbolizes the one barrier that humanity cannot cross. And it's this. We can never be God. We're children of God. We're creatures. We're contingent. We're dependent. But we can never be God. So the, the seduction of the serpent is precisely in convincing man and woman, God is not your provident father. He is a, he is a oppressor. He is a, um, a rival. Um, you're really not happy being in a relationship with him. Be your own God. Make your own decisions about what is right or wrong. Define your own good and evil. Articulate your own truth. Live apart <coughs> from his sovereignty, because that's where freedom lies. All of that should sound very familiar to us, because it's the siren song of our culture today. So everything we're dealing with today is as old as Genesis 3. It just, it just gets recycled and comes back in another form, right? But here we are again. There's an art museum in Phoenix that has a stunning painting from the 19th century. And it depicts a scene not narrated in the scriptures, but it's, uh, it depicts the moment when Adam and Eve discovered the dead body of their son, Abel. And the artist was masterful in depicting at least four emotions on their faces. One is shock, because they've never seen a dead body before. Secondly is grief, because it's their son. Third is horror, because they realize one of their other children did it. And fourth, it's shame, because they realize that their own original sin was, was somehow the contributing factor that led to this homicide. So all of that is depicted in their faces. When I was a child, my parents had some rules to survive our childhood. As I said, I had five brothers, no sisters. So my poor mother, right? Sometimes she'd lock herself in the bathroom just to have five minutes of peace, I think. But um, one rule in our house is you couldn't throw things in the living room. It's a great rule. So I'm four years old. I'm in the living room, minding my own business, I must say. One of my brothers comes in and throws a ball to me, and I catch it. I throw it back, only instead of going to him, it hits one of my mother's porcelain vases on the wall that she had gotten as a wedding gift. <clears throat> It broke not into four pieces, it broke into like 22 pieces. Irreparable. So I never read Genesis at the age of four. But I immediately did what Adam and Eve did. I ran upstairs and hid under my bed. So just that, that instinctive response to shame, that instinctive response to I've done something profoundly wrong and I need to hide. So my mother comes up the stairs like God himself, pulls me out, confronts me with the deed, and again, I did what Adam and Eve did next. I blamed somebody else. Like, it's not my fault. My brother threw the ball. So it's amazing how that concupiscence is baked into our DNA. Like I'm acting out Genesis chapter 3 at the age of 4 without even realizing what I'm doing. I mean, it's, it's all there inside of us. So when I think of the world after the original sin, I think of my mother's broken vase and how she just resignedly swept up the pieces because it was beyond fixing. And the, and the shame and guilt I felt because that vase was broken because I disobeyed. And so it is with the world. So to, to ponder the, the evil, suffering, and death of the world is overwhelming. 
all the genocides, the, the Holocaust, all the wars, all the abuse, all the violence, all the people that have died because of poverty, malnutrition, um, every single particular individual <coughs> sin of every particular person that has ever lived and ever will live. The thing of the enormity of that is just literally overwhelming. We can't even wrap our minds around it. So that, that's the state we find ourselves in because of sin which ushers in death. So that, that second step is where in many ways our world is and our people are trapped in despair without hope, just trying to get through the day. It's no accident that, that our country consumes uh, a huge percentage of the world's illegal drugs. So what is it about our culture that so many people in our country feel they, they need to be drunk, high, or somehow medicated in order to get through the day? I mean, that's evidence of a profound spiritual crisis that, that's beyond description. It's because they're trapped in sin and death. But the great powerful news of the Kerygma is already contained in chapter 3 of Genesis. And it's in verse 15. And the church fathers called it the, the Proto-Evangelium, the pre-gospel. And it's the amazing prophecy that God utters to the serpent when he says, there will be a woman whose son will crush your head. So there will be, there will be a son of a woman who will, in an absolute, total way, crush your power and destroy it. What an astonishing prophecy. That in, just as those first ripples of the effects of original sin are fanning out, God already rushes in and promises us a way out, a way of salvation, that, that he will send his son, born of Mary. So, of course, Mary is the new Eve, as Jesus is the new Adam. In John's Gospel, Jesus addresses his mother twice, once at Cana, once from the cross. In both instances, he calls her woman. Sounds a little disrespectful to our modern ears. Like, don't go home and call your mother woman. She may not appreciate it. But of course, he's making a theological statement there. He's saying his mother is not simply a woman, not just some random woman. She is the woman. She's the woman of the apocalypse. She's the woman of Nazareth. She's the woman prophesied in Genesis. She, she's the mother of the Son of God. In a sense, she is the new Eden, this, this immaculate garden where God places his Son as he enters into the world. So how, how important our relationship with the Blessed Mother is, that, that she leads us to Christ. So all of that is, is the second part of the kerygma, you know, the, the power of sin and death, and yet God coming to our rescue. So third step, and of course, the, the centrality of the gospel is this. It, it's the mission of Christ. So I think looking at uh, the mission of Christ through the lens of the kerygma, we realize that it's fundamentally a rescue mission. That God, God comes to our rescue in our state of being unable to save ourselves or rescue ourselves. All of humanity is in this burning building and, and the Lord rushes in to pull us out and save us. So I always picture the Trinity talking among themselves before the incarnation. And I picture the Father looking at the world and saying, this is a disaster. This is not what we intended. You know, we wanted... Um, our children to live in harmony with ourselves, with one another. Look how they are hating, killing each other. They don't know us. Father weeping. Holy Spirit concurring and saying, yes, this, this was not what we want for them. We need to do something radical. And I picture the Father saying, one of us needs to go down there. And I picture the Son raising his hand and saying, Father, I'll go. Father, I'll go. So the Son coming to our rescue in human form to save us from sin and death. It's the age of the story of, of the scriptures. It's the center of human history. It's the pivot of the universe. And it's the wonder of the incarnation that we never get over in the beauty of Christmas. 
that God so loved the world that he sent us his son. Christianity is the only world religion that believes that the universal, mysterious, all-powerful, invisible God became one of his own creatures, humbled himself to become one of us, entered into our human experience in every way except sin to redeem us from inside our own human reality. That's overwhelming to think about the humility of God in the incarnation. As Bishop Barron says, it's as if God drops his son behind enemy lines, unbidden, unnoticed, and yet coming to subvert the power of the evil one. So the Lord enters his own creation in such a quiet, simple, vulnerable way as, as an infant. And already there's forces out to destroy him. So we think of the, the slaughter of the innocents and the jealousy and rage of, of King Herod, the flight into Egypt. So evil knows who Jesus is, as we know from the synoptics. It's, it's Satan who is the first one to recognize the, the presence of the divine in this, in this man from Nazareth the whole messianic secret. So the Lord saves us in three ways. Number one, through his incarnation. That in the person of, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we have the fullness of God's divinity and the fullness of our humanity minus sin perfectly joined. That he is one divine person with two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. So already by his incarnation, the Lord is beginning to heal the chasm, the, the vast distance that sin and death drove between us and God is bringing us together. Secondly, through his ministry. So everything that the Lord did that's narrated in the scriptures was to proclaim the kingdom of God, to heal the human person, to announce the forgiveness of sins. So every person he meets, I can't help but think of Jesus kind of as this Divine physician asking every person, where does it hurt? How can I help you? So that looked differently for every person. But think of my mother's vase, irretrievably broken. So the Lord is putting together the broken pieces of every single person. And that's where his healing power is so manifest. And we need to have greater confidence, I think, in the healing power of Jesus. So to pray with people, to, to realize the Lord wants to transform your life right now. You don't have to wait until you're dead to experience the glory of God. But the power of the resurrection is right here, right now. And that the Lord wants us to live this abundance, this fullness of life, even now in this valley of tears. I think that the, one of the most beautiful examples of all of that is the healing of the paralytic. So we're familiar with the narrative in both Mark and Matthew. These four friends bring their friend to the Lord, their paralyzed friend. And they know that if they can just get him in front of Jesus, everything will be all right. The Lord will heal him. And so the friends can't get near him. So think of the logistics of this. They take him up on the roof of the house. So imagine being a paralyzed man. It's like my friends are like taking me up on this roof. Then they open a hole in the roof. Nobody asks, you know, how the, the owner of the house is going to feel about somebody tearing apart their roof. But they have just this absolute conviction. We need to get our friend in front of the Lord. And if we do so, he will heal him. We absolutely believe this. So they lower him down. They get the Lord's attention. And what does Jesus say? Your sins are forgiven. Doesn't heal his limbs. Forgives his sins. As if to say... I know you want me to heal your friend's paralysis, and we'll get to that. But let me heal the most profoundly troubling thing about your friend, and that's his sin. So he heals his soul first, and then he heals his body. So the Lord wants to heal the totality of us, put together the broken pieces. And we see that throughout the Lord's ministry. Then, of course, ultimately and absolutely in his crucifixion, and resurrection. So we, we can never pass a crucifix with indifference. Think of the tens of thousands of times you've looked at a crucifix. It'd be easy to say, I've seen that before. <coughs> but in every crucifix, we see Jesus with his head bent to kiss us, his arms open to embrace us, his feet nailed fast to 
pardon our sins. So in, in the crucifixion, we see the totality of God's love for us. That he wraps himself, he embraces, he gets underneath all of our sin and death and had to do so in order to transform it. So he goes so low that he's underneath all of our despair, all of our darkness, all of our self-hatred. And he lifts it up to the Father in this tremendous act of complete oblation. When I ponder the crucifix, I think of two things. Number one, how grievous my sin must be to the Lord if this is the solution. It's like if the cure to my sin is the death of the Son of God on the cross, how grievous my sin must be to the Father's heart if that's what it took to heal me, to save me. But the second thing I think of is how much my soul must matter to the Lord if he decided that that sacrifice was worth it. So in the crucifixion, I realize both the grievousness of my sin, but also my absolute value as a son of God in the, in the eyes of the Father. What a, what a remarkable thing. And so the, the Lord allows death to do its worst on him. And yet, the Father has one last card to play. And so in the, the fullness of the resurrection, we, we see the, the victory of life over death, grace over sin, mercy over hatred. And it's in the resurrection then that the Holy Spirit is sent forth for us. So when, when I move from having my salvation simply as a beautiful idea like when the conviction that the Son of God traded his life for mine on the cross so that I could live forever, when that moves from simply being an idea in my head to being an absolute conviction in my heart and then becoming the fire in my soul, then, then I'm a missionary disciple. Then I've been cut to the heart. Then I've heard the gospel. And that's what we're called to do with and for our people and so the fourth part of the kerygma is really our response to this inordinate gift offered to us through the Paschal Mystery, a life of discipleship, when we realize what God has done. And so the Eucharist as this um, act of thanksgiving, this perpetual act of thanksgiving on the part of the church is really ultimately praising God for the gift of Jesus Christ in his incarnation, death, and resurrection, this Eucharist. This Thanksgiving. When I was in second grade, my mother went back to work half time as a nurse at a Catholic nursing home. And of all of her jobs as a nurse, she loved that one the best. But on the weekends that she worked, uh, we would go to Mass on Saturday night because my mom had to leave at five in the morning to go to work. And on those Sundays, my father would wake all of us up and make us go to Mass again. <laughs> It was like Saturday night didn't count for my father. <laughs> so I, I never fought going to Mass. I'd even go to Mass during the week. But I would resist going to the same Mass twice in 12 hours. So I'd say that to my dad. I'd say, it's going to be the same priest, same homily, same music, it's the same Mass. We were just there last night. He's going to think we're fanatics. I don't want to go. And he'd always say two things. Number one, I don't care. So I, I knew I was losing the battle. That's the fatherly response. But then he would say this, and it stuck with me my whole life. Don't you think that God has done enough for you this week that you can give him two hours of praise and thanks? Like, don't you think God has done enough for you that you can go to Mass twice if it's really about thanking him and praising him? But God isn't stingy with you. Why are you being stingy with him? But God didn't count the cost with you. Why, why are you parceling out your hours with him? My parents profoundly understood the Eucharist as our response to the graciousness of the offer of salvation given to us in Christ. And I can't help but think that somehow that was part of the matrix that formed my vocation. One of my favorite um, scripture passages is John chapter 12. And it's the anointing at Bethany. So just hours, days before his fearful passion, the Lord has dinner for the last time with his best friends, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. 
And in the course of that dinner, Mary does something absolutely astounding. She gets up from the table. She comes back with this alabaster jar of costly aromatic nard. And she breaks it open. And she pours it on the feet of Jesus. And then dries his feet with her hair. And the whole house is filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And it's Judas Iscariot from whom we learn the cost of that perfume because he wants that money for himself. So he says, why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 days wages and the money given to the poor? So that perfume cost almost a year's salary. I have never spent a year's salary to buy a gift for a friend. Have you? That's probably more than an engagement ring, right? Imagine taking an entire year's salary, even a priest's salary, and, and buying a gift for a friend. And that's just a lavish over-the-top, just extreme act of generosity. Why does she do it? Perhaps because in the previous chapter 11, Jesus raised her brother from the dead, and she's just so filled with joy and gratitude. Perhaps it's a foreshadowing of Jesus' burial and the anointing of his body. The, the passage hints at that. But maybe it's just because Mary realized who the Lord was and what he had done for her and she needed to somehow externally express to him some gesture of absolute generosity because he had been so generous with her. Maybe it was all three of those. But I think of, of those two figures, Mary and Judas. Mary representing Catholic maximalism, Judas representing minimalism. So minimalist asks the question, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to keep from failing this class? What do I have to do to get into heaven? What's the bare minimum the church asks of me? Minimalists take all the energy out of the room. Maximalists ask a very different question because they're in love. They ask the question, what can I do? So all of you are maximalists because in one way or another, God has invaded your life and and you've embraced that life of discipleship and you've moved into the question, Lord, what can I do for you? So when, when we love another, we, we don't count the cost or measure what we give. We simply give our all. Imagine a married couple saying to each other, I kissed you twice this week. That's my quota. I'm done. <laughs> or imagine a mother saying, you know, I've cooked the last 389 meals consecutively in this house. I'm not doing that anymore. Or a father saying, I'm not going to go to work. I'm tired of that. When you're in love, what you're doing never feels like enough. When you're not in love, the little you're doing already feels like too much. So I think we know when someone's been cut to the heart and when they have truly heard the gospel because they move from this stance of minimalism to one of maximalism. And from my parish experience, and I'm sure from yours as well, is not our greatest frustration and even our greatest grief the fact that so many of our people are still kind of in this minimalistic stance, right? Remember, uh, my first assignment um, was a suburban parish in Milwaukee. We had 90 weddings a year, if you can imagine, back then. Everybody was getting married. Our slots were 10 noon and 2 on Saturdays. Many a Saturday morning, I'd be pushing a bride down the aisle at 9.59, because if this started late, it was going to mess the whole day. <laughs> but so often at the end of a wedding mass, on a Saturday, somebody would come up and say, does this count for Sunday, right? It's like, you just want to go through the ceiling. It's like, if you really love God, you wouldn't be asking that question, right? But I think my greatest frustration, my greatest grief as a parish priest, and I'm sure for you as deacons and priests, is just how do we move our people from this position of lukewarmness to fire, from this place of minimalism to maximalism? from saying, what do I have to do? Like, what's the bare minimum that the church requires of me to being all in? And when you see the, that power of grace working <coughs> in somebody's life, um, you see the wonder of the Holy Spirit. So really, I think the question becomes, how do we create an environment in our parish where people can more easily fall in love with God? where they can really hear the good news, where they can be cut to the heart, 
where they come to realize and know themselves as beloved children of God, called to be missionary disciples. The, the key to all of that, the, the secret to all of that, the, the lens through which we need to look at all of those questions is the kerygma. Because when somebody has heard the kerygma and absorbed it, they can't help but move into a stance of missionary discipleship. Because then the gospel has cut them to the heart. So our ministry um, as servants of the Lord is really fundamentally about proclaiming the kerygma. Every once in a while I read uh, what we as bishops are supposed to be doing, like what's the job description of a bishop. And I'm always struck, the, the very first thing is proclaim the gospel. <coughs> it's not go to fundraisers, it's not go to meetings, it's not all the stuff that we end up doing as bishops. It's proclaiming the gospel. So for the last three years, I've been doing a parish mission once a month somewhere in the diocese of Madison, and essentially just proclaiming the kerygma, stretching out over a couple nights what I, I gave to you in an hour, and just inviting people to make the, this personal decision for Christ, to make the, this personal response to everything that the Lord has done for us. So I think for many, many decades, we, we lived in a Catholic culture that in many ways did that for us, or at least brought people into <clears throat> sacramental participation. But in many ways, as we know, that the culture has disappeared. Just think of the, the Dutch bishop I was talking to 12 years ago. So we really find ourselves back in the position of the early church, needing to go out and proclaim the gospel afresh so people can hear it, that their hearts are, are torn open by the love of God, by a conviction of their sin, and by their radical need for Jesus. When that happens, then wondrous things happen, and souls come to Christ. And how privileged we are to have a, a front row participatory seat in, in that great mission and that great adventure. I think that's that might be enough for the moment. Um, I don't know if you have comments, anything you would want to say in response to any of that or just how you see the charisma, how you articulate it. What would you add? What, what, what am I missing? What needs to be said and lived? Anything at all? Father Patrick. Have you found uh, in giving these visions, have you found any part of the of this story more received or less received? Uh, any parts of this, of this the kerygma that people are more in tune, more, in, mm -hmm. more drawn to than others? Yeah, so what part of the kerygma are people drawn to or not drawn to? I'd say that the power of speaking of the death and resurrection of Christ, like the Paschal mystery, and like helping people to see that in a very personal way is very attractive. I think, no surprise, the challenging part is to help people um, see their sinfulness, right? I think that's always the hard part. Um, so it's like we, we want to get to Easter, we want to get to the good news, but like to get there, you also need to realize your own, your own sinfulness. And I think um, for us as Americans in the 21st century, it's very difficult because for you, you know all the reasons. But, but when we, we can get there, there's a freedom to that, right? So how freeing it is to stand before you and just say, I'm a mess, I'm a sinner, I need salvation. Um, because if we don't let God be God for us, then the only other alternative is to be our own God. And how exhausting that is. Because it means I always have to be in control, I always have to have the answers, I always have to be right. And you see that in our culture. How freeing it is to let God be God because then it means I can just, I can acknowledge my weakness. It's the whole mystery of St. Paul's writings. You know, I, I find my strength in my weakness. I can do all things in him who strengthens me. Yesterday's second reading, the thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians. I mean, Paul realized that it wasn't going to be through justification by the law but in his surrender to grace as somebody who is powerless and sinful. So when people can come to see that, um, 
there, there's a, a freedom in that. I just was in Denver last week for, um, but Bishop Powers, you were part of St. Paul Evangelization Society thing. You were in uh, Portland. Yeah, ours was in Denver. And uh, Curtis Martin came and talked to us. And he said, for him, the point of entry to engage, say, atheists or agnostics about the faith is, he starts by asking the question, do you think the world is as it should be? Like, do you think everything in the world is as it should be? And he's never found a person that said, yes, it is. And then the second question, his follow-up question was, do you think everything inside of you is as it should be? And he said, even the most hardened atheist says no to both of those questions. So if we can begin by awakening within people uh, kind of this, this rightful and healthy dissatisfaction with the status quo, that really can lead us to a conviction of our sin, right? That there, there's something wrong with me, there's something wrong with the world, and we all know it, and it's just like, what's the solution? Now, atheists and agnostics may have different things they're dissatisfied about, but, but at least we can agree on that common dissatisfaction that things are not as they should be. Um, I, I just found that compelling. Father? I'm just wondering about, um, is there such a thing as, as uh, cheap grace? You know, is, is there a way in which you know, proclaiming the charisma that, that we, in a way, steamroll over sin to get to the, the, the mystery of Christ's redemption mm -hmm. and, and the, the cross and the resurrection? Uh, do, we, do we miss out on something uh, through that, you know, forgetting to proclaim the, that sin? Because it's part of the essential understanding yeah. of Christ. Well, that's a, that's a very good question and a very good point. What it reminds me of is like in the in the RCA process, at least in the early church, and I think as it still should be, um, the catechumens are dismissed before the liturgy of the Eucharist. So they're not exposed to the whole mystery. It's like they're just taking it sequentially one piece at a time. And I think like by, by proclaiming the whole kerygma, do people just rush to the end and say, okay, I'm saved, I'm forgiven, all is good without dwelling enough on part two? It's a, it's a great question that I have no answer to. <laughs> but I, I think it's, how, how do we help people to kind of dwell in each one and really absorb that without just superficially gliding across the whole thing? I think maybe that's, that's your question, and it's a very good question, right? Yeah. Kind of related really to that, the question that keeps coming up in my mind is I think as parishes and probably as a diocese, we want to like toss everybody on the conveyor belt of the charisma and see them come out the other side of it. Yeah. In my own life, I know redemption is a, a mystery that we can't yeah. control either. And right. like that movement from salvation being this intellectual concept that you talked mm -hmm. about so beautifully to cutting to the heart, we can't control that. There are ways we can we know kind of tend to work to facilitate that, right. but the Holy Spirit does that. Can you mm -hmm. talk about, like in your own experience in your ministry, how to really lean into that aspect of the charisma? Like, like it is through God's providence that people either come to deep life right. or not. And what, what can you do with that? It's that it's. I don't know if everybody can hear it. That it's we're not controlling the outcome. It isn't just like this factory piece where we can just put out evangelized people um, that really it's, it's up to people's personal decision. Something I find consolation in in a way is the number of people that walked away from Christ, right? So even if the Son of God wasn't able to capture every person, like who am I to think I'm going to, right? So that a good dose of humility is, is helpful there. But, but I think it reminds us of the importance of praying for the people that we serve, that we encounter, that we seek to evangelize, that we are preparing perhaps for the sacraments, that really perhaps the most important thing we're doing is praying for them.
and being a witness to them. But, but realizing that um, it isn't just automatic, right? But that at least we put on people's hearts, here, here's the truth and, and here's the gospel. It's up to them to decide. And there's all sorts of um, passages in the Office of Readings. Most recently, uh, St. Augustine's protracted reflection on shepherds, which is coupled with Ezekiel. <laughs> And I always feel like I'm a really bad bishop when I read that because it talks about, you know, the courage to say the truth, you know, to, to just, you know, hammer people almost. And I, I struggle with, like, how to, you know, that fusion of love and truth. And sometimes you have to land on a different emphasis of that without ever surrendering the integrity of it, right? So I always say um, truth without love is harsh, rigid, judgmental at least can be love without truth becomes sentimental and vacuous but put the two together and you have a firepower of the gospel so we love people enough to give them the fullness of the truth but always in a in a relationship of mercy and compassion but then it's really up to them what they do with it but yeah that's because we're always looking for numbers you know it's like people already asking me like with all of our efforts in madison have you seen mass numbers rise it's like well not necessarily. I mean, some places, but it's it's pretty it's pretty erratic. We're not on this automatic ascent, but that that can be very disheartening sometimes, especially when you spend a lot of time with somebody and then they just kind of still. Remember my first assignment? There was a couple who their their house burnt down and they all escaped just by with an inch of their lives, and they hadn't been practicing the faith, and that did something to them. That it it really stirred them up. So they were coming to me. So a couple of their kids hadn't been baptized. Um, they had missed sacraments along the way. They started coming to Mass. And I worked with them. And then the crisis passed, and they kind of drifted away. And I tried to connect with them, and they were no longer in. It was like but they were there for a while. It was like that seed that was sown on the rocky ground and then never sprouted. And I think to remember the parable of the sower is, is probably good. Many of you probably remember the Sunday after 9-11, yeah. right? Our churches were just packed. Next Sunday, not. <laughs> Prices had passed, right? So it's like um, we're pretty good in crisis. We know where to turn, but uh, take, take the gun away from our head and we kind of go back to normal. So it's like how do we live, how do we live in the intensity of, of the reality uh, you know, that, that life itself is a crisis if we look at it as an um, opportunity, right? But very good point. Yes? I think one of the, the most difficult things about having an elevator speech ready is not having an elevator speech ready. And what I mean by that is there's a fear of, like, what am I supposed to say? How do I say it? It isn't the right thing. And all the time we're thinking about what we want to say and not what the person wants to hear or needs to hear. Mm -hmm. And I grew up as a, as a young man, and I became very much involved with the Navigator group, uh, which is basically you're emphasizing you know, John 3.16, yeah. and you're a sinner, and you'll go to hell. And, yeah. and I realized that that's not what people want to hear, is that it's fear and loathing. It's really about love. Mm -hmm. And so I have come to think uh, a Catholic way of doing this is to emphasize God's love and mercy and, com and compassion. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to judge. Jesus did not chase down sinners and mm -hmm. point them out in the street, but to give them what they need to hear. Mm -hmm. And you have to regain that person. And it may just be a short thing, but it, it, is, it becomes a witness, and it's different than what they have heard. And that's kind of what I, I every time I come into a situation mm -hmm. where I, know I'm going to have to say something, I just say a quick prayer, mm -hmm. Lord help me to say the right thing, mm -hmm. and I don't have anything prepared, and always something comes to, do it, to, to yeah. say. Well, it's beautifully that's, said. I, that's what I have found is, is the best way of uh, introducing and inviting people yeah. uh, to Jesus Christ. Maybe the fullness of the creamer comes later, you know, yeah. that they need, they need just that little piece at the beginning. I think another powerful approach is just to speak of your own experience of the love of Christ. Because, you know, we, we live in an age where experience reigns supreme. So nobody can judge my experience. It's like, this is what I've experienced. So to appeal to people on an experiential level and just say, this is how I've experienced Christ in my life. This is what he's done 
from me, you know, they may not understand that, but they can't really say, well, no, you didn't experience that because it's yours. Right, right. and I mean, when you do that, if you're not saying some kind of formula, you're speaking from your heart. That's right. What you've experienced in your love and your relationship with Christ, and it, it, yeah. it just becomes so genuine, and so right. the people hear and sense what you're saying. Yeah, it's really, how do, you, how do you do it in a sequential way? And how, what do you say if you only have five minutes and you're never going to see that person again, right? So different approaches to it. But I think we need to be imbued in, in the whole story in order to speak even part of the story to people. So I think there's, a, there's an integrity to it, but you can't give it all in one fell swoop, that's for sure. Right? Agreed. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, in response to, to Chris's comment and question, um, I think one of the things we have to do, um, it can seem frustrating, but we have to persevere in proclaiming mm-hmm. the curriculum. Um, because you never know which time you proclaim it and how you proclaim it, which will be the trigger. It will be the hook for that particular individual. They may have heard you preach on it three, four, five <coughs> times. It just never resonates or hits them right. Um, you know, it's like fly fishing. You know, you keep casting. You don't stop casting because it doesn't hit on the first your first throw. So, um, and and one of the, the images that I think of is, I think most of us have experienced. We've read these scripture passages for decades, and yet we can read it 20 years after we first did it, 40 years, 60 years, and suddenly something about it hits us differently. You know, the Spirit has provided a moment to give us an insight. And I think the same thing happens when we try to proclaim the charisma. If we do it over and over again, the spirit will find the opportunity for it to finally hit that person mm-hmm. in the way that they need. So, so I just encourage us to, to stick with it, not give up out of frustration because we don't see numbers. Right. And what it does to us too, right? I mean, it's just uh, when it, my last parish assignment, I started a, a Legion of Mary group, whose fundamental mission is to go house to house and just visit people. So, I think there are about twelve of us. So every Friday afternoon, we'd go out in groups of two. We'd just go house to house within our parish boundaries. We had a little booklet on Catholicism, a parish bulletin, and you know, leave that if people weren't home, talk to them if they were. And in five years, I think we visited every house in our parish boundaries at least twice. And did that bring thousands of people back to Mass? I don't think so. But it was planting those seeds. But also... It, it had a deep impact on us, right? It's like we, we ourselves were, were evangelized and strengthened in, in a lot of those conversations. So, so I met people that were members of our parish that never came to Mass, and they'd say, oh, you must be the new priest there. And it's like, well, I've been there five years, but uh, yeah, I'm still kind of new, I guess. But, but some people did come back to Mass. We found out about irregular marriages. There were people that got baptized. So... Um, I'm not saying evangelization is about going house to house necessarily, but I think there's all sorts of different methods and, and different ways of doing it. And in the end, it's, it's deeply impactful on us who seek to do it. And Paul VI talks about that in Evangelii Nunciandi, that, that in essence, if you read the Gospels carefully, our salvation is contingent in a way on our sharing the good news with each other. So that Part of my response to the Lord is the need to share it with others. Curtis Martin had this great example, too. He said, let's, let's say you find this fabulous Italian restaurant. It's like the best restaurant you've ever um, experienced. And you want to go tell you, you want your neighbors to go to the restaurant. But you never tell them about it. You just hope that if they see you leave in your car every Saturday and go off somewhere, they're going to know about the restaurant and come. And his point was, of course, that we can't just give good example and think that's enough. You know, that if I'm really convicted this is the best restaurant in the world, I'm going to run across the street and tell my neighbors about it. Same with the gospel. It's like if I'm really convicted of the truth of this, like somehow it's going to come out in my relationships and dealings with others. You're not not in an annoying way, not in a overwhelming way, but in a in a joyful invitational way. So good. So I have 10.24. Um, I think, do we take a break? Chris, you're kind of a scheduled man here, right? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's quit. <laughs> you, have 20, you have 20 minutes. Good. Thank you.